turn in your Bibles with me to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, we will be looking this morning at verses 6 through 10. The title of our sermon is A Different Gospel. Galatians 1, 6 through 10. Eddie Slovic was a 24-year-old man from Detroit, Michigan, who was passed over for military service during World War II because he had a series of small criminal convictions. But in January of 1944, as the war continued to rage on, there was a need for more men, and Slovic was drafted and underwent training as a rifleman in the Army. Uh, by the end of the summer, Slovic had arrived in France with an entire group of replacements for the Army's 28th Infantry Division. That unit had suffered heavy losses during the Battle of Normandy, so before they pushed into Germany, they needed once again to be strengthened. And as Slovic was making his way to the front lines of the battle, his unit came under heavy artillery fire. And as soon as the fire ceased, Slovic made his way to the rear of the unit and attempted to t attach himself to a Canadian unit. And he was able to remain with the Canadians for six weeks until they turned him over to the American military police. On October 7, 1944, Slovic reported to the commanding officer of the 28th Infantry Division. And the next day, he requested a transfer to the rear echelon explaining he was too scared to serve on the front lines of battle. And when his commander refused his request, the private openly declared to his platoon leader his intentions to desert. The following morning, he made good on his threat, abandoning his position and walking several miles once again to the rear. And in the afternoon, he presented himself at the division headquarters with a handwritten confession of his desertion. In the note, he claimed that he was too scared to fight and asked for a transfer to a support unit. There was a junior officer present at the headquarters who urged Slovic to tear up the note to return to his unit, but Slovic refused, saying he'd rather spend the entirety of the war in jail than go to the front lines of battle. He was immediately placed under arrest by the military police and while in custody, Slovic was advised by a colonel to destroy his confession, once again go back to the front line, and once again he refused, and as a result, he was thrown into the stockade. Even while in custody, his appointed legal representative pled with Slovic to reconsider even offering him a transfer to a different rifle company, but he continued to refuse, saying he'd rather be court-martialed. And so on November 11, 1944, Eddie Slovic was tried and convicted by a military court for desertion by nine staff officers, and he was sentenced to death by firing squad. On December 23rd, Slovic tried one last time to avoid execution by writing to the Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force in Europe, who was at the time General Dwight D. Eisenhower, seeking a Christmas reprieve, However, the damage had already been done, and on the morning of January 31st, 1945, a mere 96 days before the end of the war in Europe, Private Eddie Slovic was strapped to a post on a farm in France and shot to death by 12 riflemen. Now, to the average person, that may sound extreme. The man was obviously scared for his life. He was under very abnormal, involuntary circumstances, but in times of war, doing anything with the intent to avoid hazardous duty or to knowingly endanger a combat mission is a serious crime that is associated with cowardice, cowardice and a lack of dedication to one's country. And an oath as a citizen, and an oath as a member of the armed forces, desertion has always been a serious crime in the military. And to this day, if anyone is declared to be a deserter in times of war, the consequences are typically swift and severe. And as we turn our attention back to Paul's letter to the Galatians this morning, we come to one of the most direct rebukes you will ever read in all of Scripture. 
The apostle had received word that the Galatians in the Galatian churches were do so, doing something far worse than deserting their country in a time of war. The Galatians were deserting the gospel that they had received under the preaching of the apostle. They were following the false teaching of the Judaizers who had perverted the gospel, who were instead telling the Galatians that true Christian faith was the gospel plus <laughs> adherence and devotion to the ceremonial aspects of the Mosaic Covenant. And indeed, to embrace such a false teaching was to desert Christ himself. It was to desert God himself. And the result of deserting Christ is surely a death of a different kind. And Paul has very strong language for those who would desert Christ and for the false teachers who would lead them astray. So let's read together Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Well, if you do a quick survey of Paul's epistles, you will notice a very uh, different way in which the other letters begin when you compare it to the book of Galatians. The first five verses we looked at last time follow the same general pattern in all of his letters. But now as we get into verses 6 through 10, you will notice that Paul gets straight to the point for which he is writing. In his other letters, he typically will offer a note of thanksgiving or a prayer of spiritual encouragement. But the severity of the case with the churches in Galatia has Paul skipping his normal pattern and getting straight into his rebuke. Now, you know this is serious for Paul because even in his letter that he wrote to the Corinthians... He sort of eases into the hard words that he has for them as a result of the many problems that they had in their church. But that is simply not the case with Galatians. In this instance, the very essence of the gospel is at stake. God saves his people by grace alone. And the Judaizers had convinced the Galatians Otherwise, so Paul is on a mission in this letter to rescue his beloved Galatians from apostasy, and he doesn't waste any time. So the first thing we can identify in our passage, we see in verse 6, that Christians should be shocked when anyone deserts Jesus Christ for false teaching. Look again at verse 6. He writes, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Now Paul is expressing his astonishment here to the Galatians who are in the process of deserting the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're embracing the teaching of the Judaizers. Now this isn't some irrational burst of anger from the apostle. It's a statement of distress. It's a statement of shock. It's almost as to say, I cannot believe you are doing this. More literally, he's writing here, you have removed yourselves from the gospel. They were in the process of apostatizing from the true gospel to devote themselves to what they were being taught was a greater religious devotion. It was a false gospel of Christianity plus Judaism. Remember, Paul was the earthly founder of the Galatian churches. He taught them the gospel. And through his preaching, by the power of the Holy Spirit, many of the Galatians were transformed and turned away from pagan idolatry and from Judaism to embrace the gospel of Christ. 
they had believed in their hearts and confessed with their mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord. And the Lord did this, Paul writes, in the grace of Christ. And so Paul preached, they heard, they knew the truth, they received the truth. And he writes that they are deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ. He's referring to the internal or effectual calling that happens when the Holy Spirit savingly applies the gospel to one's heart and life as we hear the gospel. It's the call of salvation. It is full, it is free, no strings attached. And so it's important to remember here that Paul was fully convinced that the Galatians had received this effectual calling. Now perhaps this raises a theological question for you. I don't want to get us bogged down here, but it's important to address because it will get us through the entirety of this letter. One might want to argue if the Galatians are truly apostate, if they are deserting God to follow another gospel, which is no gospel at all, then that call could not have ultimately been effectual. However, we have to see that Paul is not convinced that they are fully apostate. Notice he writes that they are turning to a different gospel, not that they have turned completely. They are in the process, but he is still optimistic. Until the Galatians breathed their last breath, Paul so no, saw no reason to conclude that they were, in fact, never saved in the first place. He saw them as a people who had embraced Christ. He saw in their lives a true and living faith. And so he still had hope that they would hear what he has to say and they would once again reject anything that was contrary to the gospel of God's free grace. Let's not be quick to write someone off as a non-believer because there may be troubling times when they get off track. Sometimes we may see a Christian embrace some crazy ideas or some unorthodox or unbalanced theological idea. And instead of taking time with them, praying for them, pleading with them, and hopefully helping to set them on a solid course, we often just immediately conclude, I guess they were never a true Christian. But Paul gives us a great example here. We need to be patient. We need not automatically assume that there were the tares among the wheat. But notice here what Paul writes very intentionally. He's warning them through a strong rebuke. He wants to make sure that they understand that to abandon what they have received is not simply to, to turn away from an idea or a concept or from one flavor of Christianity to another. This isn't them leaving a Baptist church to become Presbyterians, God forbid. <laughs> this is a matter of the heart of the gospel. And so to turn away as a deserter on this basis is to abandon God himself. He's literally saying here, you have removed yourselves from Christ. And he calls it a different gospel. In other words, they have embraced another religious system. It, it calls itself Christian, when in fact it is no Christianity at all. It has nothing in common with the true gospel. And indeed, there are many religious systems in the 21st century that call themselves Christian, when in fact they are not Christian at all. They preach a different gospel entirely. Now, don't assume here that Paul is using hyperbole when he says he is astonished. He's shocked. He's amazed at their desertion. The reality is that whenever we as Christians see anyone turn away from Christ, we should all be astonished. Think of what we have, brethren. Remember, back in verses 3 and 4, Paul showed us, God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. That's the heart of what we believe, isn't it? We were at enmity with God. 
We were counted as his enemies. And yet, in his great love, God sent his only son into this world to live a perfect life, fulfilling the law of God perfectly for his enemies. Fulfilling the law on our behalf, dying on the cross to pay the penalty that was due to our sins, a death that we deserve to die, so that we need not bear the weight of God's wrath ourselves. And he was raised from the dead, securing for us everlasting life with him, that we need not taste the sting of death, but instead we may be glorified and enjoy the new heavens and the new earth forever and ever. It's not something we had to earn. In fact, it's not something we ever could earn. It's not anything we deserve, for all we have ever deserved is the anger and judgment of God. Our salvation is completely and totally because of the matchless, amazing love of God that you and I even heard the gospel in the first place, let alone were effectually called by the Holy Spirit to believe it. Amazing grace, unfathomable love, matchless mercy from our amazing God. And yet, there are those who will desert this God. This God who has set them free to walk in the liberty of salvation, to walk in the freedom of Christ, to put themselves back into the chains of works righteousness in a false religious system. Brothers and sisters, that should be shocking to all of us. If we have truly tasted of the goodness of God, if we have truly drank the water of life, if we've truly eaten of the bread of life, if we've known the blessing of union with Christ, if we've experienced the unfathomable goodness of communion with God in His grace, if we've known His love and His kindness and His goodness and His faithfulness and His grace and His mercy in our own lives, how could we ever look at someone who appears to be turning away and deserting Christ and simply shrug our shoulders? And just move on for them as if it isn't the worst thing that could ever happen in their lives. There's nothing worse. And may it never be that our hearts would be so unconcerned with the souls of those who have walked with us in Christ's church that we would ever be anything less than astonished by their desertion to another gospel. Deserting the God of the Bible to once again embrace the slavish chains of works righteousness should make us weep. We must pray to God that we would never see that in our midst. Among the brethren in our own church, our our people, our brothers and our sisters, amongst the true brethren of the church around the world, may it never be that we would grow content with watching anyone walk away from the church of Jesus Christ. And may the Lord be pleased to preserve us that we would never depart. Well, Paul goes on with a word of clarity in verses 7 through 9 to show us that there is only one gospel and false teaching is a damnable offense Look again at verse 7. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Now, Paul's point here is to say, I've said that they are teaching you a different gospel. But the reality is that there is only one gospel. Anything else, anything contrary to what has been proclaimed to you as the gospel is no gospel at all. Why? Because the gospel is the good news of God in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So to desert... The free grace of God and embrace a system of works is to abandon anything that could ever truly be called good. It's not good at all. It's chains. It's slavery. It's a weight of bondage. 
It's interesting in verse 7, Paul writes, there are some who try to trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. The word translated as distort literally means to reverse or to, to turn inside out. So Paul is pointing his finger at these Judaizers and he's saying, these people are trying to turn you inside out. The Judaizers were trying to reverse the order of things. But you might ask, what's, what's really so wrong with what the Judaizers were teaching? Why is Paul saying it's damnable? It's that serious? Were they saying that Christ is not the Messiah? No. Were they saying that faith in Christ is unnecessary? No, not at all. Were they promoting the idea that Christ was not divine or that he wasn't raised from the dead? Again, no. What they were doing was denying the fact that faith in Christ was enough. They denied the biblical principle of sola fide, faith alone. Martin Luther comments on the, nation, uh, on the nature of this false teaching and the foolishness of embracing it. He writes... Where the righteousness of the law rules, there the righteousness of grace cannot rule. And where the righteousness of grace reigns, the righteousness of the law cannot reign. One of them must give way to the other. If you cannot believe that God will forgive your sins for Christ's sake, he who was sent into the world to be our high priest, how then will you believe that he will forgive you through the works of the law that you could never perform or through your own works, which as you must be obliged to confess, cannot prevail against God's judgment? I hope you can follow Luther's line of reasoning. You can either have a salvation by grace or a salvation by works, but the two cannot coexist. That makes perfect sense, right? If you are saved by grace, it is by grace alone, through faith, apart from works of the law, as Paul teaches all throughout his letters. If you're attempting to be saved by the law, the only avenue for the forgiveness of sins is through perfect obedience to the law, and you cannot perfectly obey the law. It is impossible. And so how could you ever possibly stand in light of God's judgment. Again, it's impossible. That's what has Paul so concerned. If you're going to live according to a covenant of works, you have failed from the moment you were conceived because you were an unregenerate, unregenerate deceitful, depraved person and depraved of heart. A religion of works has no hope because God's standard isn't pretty good it isn't good enough. It isn't you gave it a good try. God's standard is absolute perfection according to his law in your heart, in your mind, and in your actions. I have yet to meet a person, even someone who would tell me, I have no place for God in my life whatsoever, but they will all say the same thing. I'm not perfect. That's the mantra of our day, isn't it? Nobody's perfect. You're right. Nobody's perfect. And that is a huge problem for all of us. We need something. We need someone outside of ourselves if we're ever to be saved because our imperfection is a damning reality. We need the free grace of God in the Lord Jesus Christ for our salvation or we have no hope. No amount of rituals or festivals or religious adherence or even our zeal will be enough. You do not want to stand before God and base your hope of salvation on yourself. And friend, if you do not know Christ this morning or if you're playing games with the gospel, if you want to say, yes, I believe in God, but I'm not so sure about all the claims of Christianity. I'm not, I'm not so sure about the idea that there's only one way to heaven. I'm not so sure that salvation could actually be a work of God entirely without me doing anything at all. I want to tell you all of that is exactly what the Bible teaches. And friend, I want to tell you, you may be thinking, I've done too many evil things. God could never love me or accept me 
Pastor, you don't know the life I've lived. You don't know the things I've thought. You don't know the things I've done. Maybe, I'll, maybe I, I will work on cleaning myself up for a while, and then once I'm good enough, I'll, I'll be back. Then I will consider Christianity. My friend, if you're thinking along those lines, I want you to know that you'll never be back. You will never clean yourself up. And in fact, the more you try, the more you will realize just how far you fall short. But the good news of the gospel that was being distorted by the false teachers in Galatia is that God alone is the author of salvation, and he calls on you to embrace Christ, all of Christ. If you would come to him by faith alone, you will be saved. No cleaning up. No greater moral efforts to get there. No religious ceremonies to go through. Just come to Christ and he will receive you with open arms. He will not reject you. He will not turn you away. A friend, the Lord has brought you here today for a reason. To hear the greatest news you could ever hear. And so do not waste today for tomorrow may never come. Look to Christ and find true, everlasting life free of any of your works, free of your own failed righteousness. Brothers and sisters, this is what Paul preached. This is what he saw the Galatians believed. But the reality is that they were turning for the rear flank to get off the front lines because the false teachers almost never come in a whole-scale rejection of what we know to be true from the scriptures. It's almost always a mixture of just enough truth, the twisting of scripture out of context, and promises of a greater experience with God to sound reasonable. The Judaizers wanted to make the gospel more palatable for a Jewish audience. They didn't want to tell the Jews that in order to embrace the gospel of Christ, that it meant to reject Judaism wholesale. Many Jews saw Christianity as sort of an adaptation of Judaism, basically assuming that, that Christian faith plus Judaism with the realized Messiah uh, was, and, and abandoning the, the ceremonial aspects of the law was, was a step too far. We don't want to go that far. We want to continue with the ceremonial aspects. It makes us feel closer to God. It makes us feel more religious. So along comes the Judaizers and they said, listen, you absolutely must have faith in Christ. They didn't deny that. He's the Messiah. You must believe that he's the Messiah that we've been waiting for. But in order to really be a Christian, you don't just believe in Christ. You have to fulfill the ceremonial law. You have to eat the right foods to keep kosher. You need to celebrate the festivals. You need to continue with the sacrifices. The males still need to be circumcised. You need to obey the 613 commands of the Mosaic law as it was interpreted and expanded in the rabbinic legal documents. In other words, belief in Jesus as the Messiah of Jewish expectation enhanced but did not replace their Judaism. Christianity was not regarded as a religion distinct from Judaism. It was the truest form of Judaism, they would have said. And to the Judaizers, a Christian was someone who was a fully realized Jew. To Paul, it was another gospel altogether, and it was damnable. To the Judaizers, a Christian was someone who, in Paul's words, was no Christian at all. John Stott comments, to tamper with the gospel is always to trouble the church. Indeed, the church's greatest troublemakers, now as then, are not those outside who oppose and ridicule and persecute it, but those inside who try to change the gospel. And that's what they're doing, right? Attempting to change the gospel. They were denying the very heart of the gospel, which is the very gracious nature of it. The fact that we cannot do anything, nor are we required to do anything in order for God to save us. They were calling it the gospel, but it was not the gospel. They were teaching intentionally devious claims. But Paul is unquestionably clear here. If you believe what they are teaching, Galatians 
you have believed a damning lie. He's saying, you must reject them. You must reject what they are teaching. In fact, Paul says you must reject anyone who preaches anything contrary to the gospel. Is it an angel from heaven? Doesn't matter. Reject him. Is it an apostle who's preaching something else? Do away with him. Even if it's me, even if it's the apostle Paul who preached to you in the beginning what he was preaching, who's now preaching something different, a different way of salvation than by grace alone, through faith alone, he says, then reject me too. It's that important. It's that serious. It's that critical to your eternal health and well-being. Now, as most of us are Christians in here, it's really easy for us to say yes and amen to what Paul is writing. And for sure, we should say yes and amen. However, you'll recall from last time that I mentioned that Paul's letter is not just about addressing false teaching and justification and doctrinal legalism. All of this is here, but the more pernicious problem that we as Christians have to be aware of in our own hearts is the issue of practical legalism. Because sometimes the false teacher that is the greatest harm to us as believers is ourselves. You see, we may not be buying the lies of the Judaizers or the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses, but we have a subtle tendency in our lives to still try to stand upon a righteousness of our own making instead of standing upon the righteousness of Christ. We have times when we can be found to live on our own finite goodness and finite wisdom and our own works instead of living upon God's infinite wisdom and infinite goodness and infinite love and infinite kindness and infinite goodness and infinite mercy. This is where something that we look at as Christians and say, I would never do that. I would never follow a false gospel. I would never listen to a false teacher. This is where we turn and say, Maybe I'm not so far removed from this like I think. What do I mean? Let me give us an example. There are a few things better than social media to help me show you this. Just think of dads and moms. There's a lot of you in here today. Let's imagine a day when your spouse is off doing something and so you decide to take your kids to the beach by yourself. So you get the kids to the beach you're going to play and have some lunch and just hang out. It's all a wonderful day in your mind. And as soon as you get there, one of the kids goes running for the water and falls and scrapes his knees and starts to cry. And while the other one darts down the beach and you can hardly see her off in the distance and you're tending to the injured child while the other one is getting further away. And meanwhile, the birds have found the food you brought and somehow, in the middle of all of that, the kids sort of ate some food and kind of played with, with each other off and on while you kept checking your watch to see if, please God, the day could almost be over. And then on the way home, you want to make a quick stop at the grocery store. And after saying, don't touch that a thousand times, having to go to the restroom at the back of the store with a cart full of groceries, having put some stuff back that magically appeared in your cart that you didn't want to buy, you eventually get to the checkout counter with all of the children asking for something they want that they see at the checkout line. And inevitably, there's some nice checkout lady who hasn't had small children in her home for like 30 years. So she has child amnesia. And she says, these are the best moments of their lives. Enjoy them. So you get the kids home, you get them in bed at 7.30, not because you're really concerned that they have an early bedtime to go to sleep for the next day, but because you really just want a few hours where you can forget that that day existed and breathe and remember that in fact you are a human being. But it's that moment, it's that moment when we decide, I'm going to get on Facebook and I'm going to find that one picture from my phone that we took at the beach that looked like everything was perfect. All the kids were having fun. Everyone was getting along. You weren't losing your mind in that one second. And you post it with a comment that says, had a great day with the kids today. I love them so much. I can't wait to do it again. Hashtag parenting rocks. Well, what's that all about? 
And then your friends with kids are going to look at that and say, what in the world? How, how are their kids always so well behaved and pleasant? And mine are turning the world upside down. Well, she's, she's over there at her house now looking for the same great picturesque moment to post to show how great and perfect their life is too. And so you end up being bitter toward one another because we all want to pretend like we've got it all together and nothing goes wrong. And I don't need anyone's help. I don't need anyone's advice. I don't need anything because we've got it together. Now, what, what's the issue? We don't stop to remember that our lives and our worth and our acceptance before God isn't based upon my own righteousness and my own works and how many people see that and give me likes on Facebook. What really matters to me, if I'm honest, is what others think about me and whether or not others accept me and think I have it all together. And if that is the case, if everyone can see me that way, then surely God will too. So you see, our hearts really aren't so far removed from the kinds of things the Judaizers were teaching, are they? That there really is something in us that we could do to make us a little more lovable to God, a little more lovable to our neighbor. We're so prone to run back to our works to prove our righteousness. But brothers and sisters, works righteousness is a lie. And it's not just a lie. Paul says it's a damning lie. That's strong language. Literally, Paul writes, if anyone is preaching anything else, let them be anathema. Let them be condemned. But I also want to be clear. Our immediate conclusion is not that those who preach a version of this different gospel will certainly be condemned. God has been merciful to many a preacher who in the first days of their ministry have ignorantly preached salvation by works. God has opened his eyes to his heir, he has repented, and eventually the man has preached the true gospel. However, where there is no true repentance and the preacher insists that a religion of good works is the way to heaven, the curse of God will ultimately fall. And all the people of the church, having heard what they've heard, having learned what they learned, will live their lives seeking to find others who will accept them on the basis of the false front they put forward. Because they have a false teacher in the pulpit, maybe, but certainly in their hearts that says, I need to do better and try harder so that God will accept me. And so God, in righteous judgment, will respond by shutting out any man from heaven who preaches a false gospel. Jesus said, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe to stumble, it would be better for him if with a heavy millstone hung around his neck, he has been cast into the sea. It is truly a matter of life and death. Well, finally, Paul closes this section by showing us the alternative to the Judaizers and their false teaching by showing us in verse 10 that servants of Christ cannot seek to be pleasers of men. Paul isn't living for man's approval. Paul doesn't have the fear of man and the desire for man's acceptance that so many of us so often do. How does he get there? Well, you know, Paul has quite a story to tell in his own life. Remember, he was on his way to murder more Christians. He was zealously killing the church of Christ because he thought it was the right thing to do. He was, he was seeing to it that everyone who was a Christian that he could get his hands on was being killed. But then he had a direct encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ who called him to be an apostle and to preach the gospel to all who would hear. He spent his entire life up to that point as good as he could in his own righteousness only to find out that it was a completely futile effort. The Lord wrecked Paul. He absolutely wrecked him and he brought him to true life in Christ. So Paul isn't just writing theologically because he knows it's true. He knows it's true because he lived it. He spun his wheels of works righteousness in the mud better than anyone else, but he never got anywhere, and he realized he could never get anywhere. 
Only when he was made able to rest in the righteousness of Christ alone was Paul able to see that his works were, as he says in Philippians chapter 2, rubbish, dung, completely and totally worthless as it pertains to salvation. So Paul's point is, why would I fear man? Why would I seek man's approval? I did this my entire life, and where did it get me? Nowhere. Brothers and sisters, are you seeking to please man and have man's approval, or are you set on pleasing God? I think as Christians, we have this false sense that when we become Christians, we can be very honest about the life that we live prior to coming to Christ, and we'll, we'll bear it all, and we'll acknowledge, I'm a sinful person, I've broken God's law, I need Christ. But then it's like we become Christians, and all of a sudden we need to portray to the world that I've got it all put together. All of a sudden, it all just came together. I don't have any sin problems. I don't have any things I'm struggling with. I don't have any issues. Brothers and sisters, this is, this is an essential element of what it means to be saved, to acknowledge up front that I need to be saved because I was sinful and I still have all these sinful tendencies within me. And if not for the grace of God, I will continue to act out of my evil heart and intentions. So... Let's just be honest. I'm broken. You're broken. We all need Christ. Life is messy. And we can be honest about the messiness of life instead of trying to hide behind convincing everyone around us that we've got it all together because we absolutely do not have it all together. Amen. And that's okay. It's okay because Christ is our all in all. It's okay to be honest about it because by the grace of God, we have been made to be new creations that when we come before our God, we need not do so hiding and trembling and fearful, but we can come before our God knowing that the blood of Christ is enough. Faith in Christ is enough. The grace of God is enough. And so I don't need to prove anything to anybody. Because I'm proven before God by the blood of Christ. I have his righteousness to stand upon and not my own. And when Christ is enough, I can turn away from anyone and everyone who tells me that for my acceptance I need to be popular or gifted or eloquent or influential or learned. That I need to occupy some high office or be acknowledged at some big conference, or write the next best-selling book. That's not the gospel. Reject everything that calls you to live a life by which your whole purpose is to pursue the approval of man. And friends, there are some of you here this morning who do just that. Your life is lived in an attempt to please man at every turn. You live for the approval of others. And you may not want to admit that it's true, but unless you are resting in Christ, unless you're standing upon Christ's righteousness alone, it's your only other option in life. I want to commend to you the Jesus who has made a way for you to stop trying to earn something. Stop trying to work your way into heaven because you'll never make it. Jesus made a way, and by faith in him, his way can be your way. Life everlasting can be yours in the Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, what are you doing in your life to prove yourself? Are you seeking the approval of others at every turn? Are you seeking to please man? Or are you focused on resting in Christ while pleasing God? We in ourselves will never be who we must be. We in Christ are all that we need to be because God will be pleased to welcome us into his kingdom. The biggest problem in my life, the biggest problem in your life, is that we're trying to win at life as though the trophy can be obtained through us. And when you take an honest look at your own life, you can see all kinds of foolishness. You can see many nights of despair. You can see many attempts at living upon yourself instead of upon Christ. And in seeing it all, you can see how easily you too could be a deserter if you're not paying attention. We need God. We need the work of the Holy Spirit to persevere to the end. 
We have the way that has been given to us that we need not be burned out or tired or man-pleasing people with discontented lives. We have the gospel. We have Christ. And we are free in Christ to live upon him. And so, brothers and sisters, be a servant of Jesus Christ. And then you won't be a slave to what anybody else might think ever again. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we are so very grateful for your word. We're so grateful for your gracious provision in the Lord Jesus Christ that we can live lives honestly, not seeking to live upon our own righteousness, not seeking to prove ourselves before man, not seeking to fulfill some some ceremonial rituals, not trying to prove our worth before you through our works. We thank you that the gospel is by grace alone, through faith alone, that we need not spin our wheels in the mud and get nowhere. We thank you that Christ has given all for us, that we might live upon him. And so we pray this morning, Lord, that for us as Christians who love you and trust you and want to walk in faithful, godly lives, that you would remind us of this very reality that so often the false teaching that we hear is not on the TV or not from a pulpit, but it's in our own hearts. And so we pray, oh God, that you would help us not not to try and live a life that proves our righteousness to the world, but that as we follow Christ, as we abide in Christ, and as we continue to live upon the truth of your word, that we would know Christ is enough. Christ is enough. I pray for anyone here this morning who does not know Christ, O oh God, that you would be at work by the power of your spirit to convict them of the reality of their brokenness and of their sin. Broken like all of us in need of a savior. Would you do that work to awaken them from death to life that they might walk forever with Christ? And we ask you to do that in the powerful, precious, and holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.